Good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, One Investment webinar series. Uh, today we have Guardian Capital, who manages uh, the One Canadian Equity Portfolio for us, uh, which has uh, many Ontario municipalities investing uh, in this project to get, get exposure to the Canadian equity markets. Uh, today we are joined by uh, individ the individuals that manage the underlying mandate from Guardian Capital. Uh, we have Ted Macklin, uh, jo Joel Hearn, uh, Sam Baldwin, and Brian Holland with us. And they'll be uh, discussing, well, they'll give a brief intro introduction to what the mandate is and uh, how it invests, the, uh, the thought process. And they'll run through uh, a deck which uh, describes uh, the positioning and where they're at. Uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to, to, to Ted to uh, start the presentation and discuss more about the, uh, the mandate. Ted? Actually, it's it's going to. I'm going to start with uh, it's Brian here, Brian Hall, and we're going to start with a quick introduction of of the strategy on page three, and you can see that um, we have a, a brief description of the overall approach. The strategy began in in uh, uh, in January of 2007, and really what it was designed to do is, as Keith was mentioning, uh, to provide exposure to the Canadian equity uh, marketplace. The idea here essentially is to try to uh, come up with a portfolio that is less risky, less volatile than what we see in, in, in other uh, portfolios in, uh, in the Canadian market. And we do this by uh, having a lower exposure to energy materials. Not so much these days, but uh, if you look over the last number of decades, uh, energy materials have been, been a very heavy weight in the index. I'll show a graphic on this in a second, and the source of a lot of volatility in the marketplace. So um, that's one of the ways that we reduce the risk in the portfolio. One of the other key ways we do it is by the nature of the holdings. So uh, what it is, is a, a portfolio of very high quality companies. And we're gonna explain what this, what this means in terms of an actual portfolio and the kinds of companies that we look at. One of the, the results though of, of reducing, not eliminating, but reducing exposure to resources is that it increases what we call the tracking error. In other words, if you don't have as much in energy and materials as the index, if obviously energy and materials does very, very well, the portfolio will be left behind. But we think that, that this is a reasonable trade-off because we can make it up in other areas of the marketplace. And when you look at the returns, you'll see that that it, it's had a, a, an enviable track record. The other thing to note in terms of diversification is the portfolio is well diversified, holding between 35 and, and 50 stocks. And at all times it's invested in a minimum of eight of the 11 sectors in the market. So on page four here, we're looking at a, a picture of the portfolio over time. And the top red line looks at the combined weight of both energy and materials in the Canadian market. And you can see if you look back in the 2008, 2009 period, it's roughly half of the, of the market. Now that's declined over the, the, the more recent years, but still when you consider that it's just two parts of the, the market, and when you compare this to larger markets like the World Index, for example, uh, the Canadian market has a very, very high exposure to resources. So you can see here that what we've done is we've taken the, uh, uh, our best ideas in the energy and materials, but reduced it. So depending on the period you're looking at, somewhere to a half or a third of the exposure to resources in the market. And here's the outcome. So what we're looking at on page five here is a, what we call a scattered diagram. What this is looking at is trying to sort of, over a 10 year period, um, compare the return that you would get versus the risk, or we measure the risk by the volatility. So um, the, the solid lines you see, the vertical line, is, that's the median level of risk, and the horizontal line is the median level of, of return. And this is against a, a sample of institutional funds uh, based on gross of fee returns and risk um, in the, the, Mercer, the Mercer survey. The index you'll see is in that little circle uh, on the lower uh, right-hand box. And the portfolio, or the one portfolio, is that um, uh, purple, purplish square in the upper left-hand box. So what this is saying is the portfolio has had significantly less 
uh, risk than either the index or other funds, but considerably better return. So this is what you, you really want. You want, obviously you want the better returns, but you want less risk for that. One of the key characteristics of having a high quality portfolio and the low risk is how it performs in falling markets. That's really ultimately the test. And you can see here on page six, this is a, this is a graphic of um, moving 12 month returns. And so you can see we've highlighted in different sections. You'll see the, the, uh, the credit crisis dip and then we get into the, uh, uh, the sovereign debt crisis in the, the uh, 2011, 12, 12 period and so on throughout the period here. And you can see again in the, the one portfolio in the purple line, falling less than the market and rebounding faster overall. That's one of the, now we can't prevent a decline in the market when a market comes, a decline comes, but the history has been is that we fall less and recover sooner. And we think that again, that speaks to the quality of the holdings that we have in the portfolio. Now with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Ted. Ted's the leader of the team on, on the core strategy. And he's gonna uh, describe um, essentially how we think of, of quality companies. Thanks, Brian. Uh, on, on the uh, quality front here, and that is the, that is the hallmark of, of our philosophy uh, that quality is a, is a driver of long-term value creation. We, we like growth companies, but we're not defined only by growth. We're not defined only by attractive valuations. Now, if you look at the uh, couple of the diagrams here on slide seven, uh, you'll, you, you can see that if you're, if you're a true value investor, you're gonna be investing in companies uh, when they have a cheap valuation, but then as it become more expensive, you have to call them and, and, and trade and find new names. Likewise, if you're growth, uh, you might be a little bit later to the story and then you have to call them when the growth starts to slow down. On quality, you're able to hold the stocks for longer time frames. You, have, you tend to have more stable, less volatility in the fundamentals and pricing uh, and allows for a longer uh, time holding period. Uh, Sam's gonna go into some of the uh, attributes, what we're looking for and how we define quality in the portfolio, but quality is, is truly the long-term driver in our uh, philosophy for our core portfolios. Sam, I'll pass it off to you if I can. Thanks, Ted. So on page eight, what we can see here is the four main criteria that we use to uh, really think about quality in this investment process. And the first hallmark of quality for us is uh, the ability for a company to generate growth over the long term. And for some of our companies, uh, the industry may be a low growth industry. Uh, but the company can outgrow the industry by having good organic growth prospects, meaning that they beat their competitors when they go head to head, but also they can supplement that uh, organic growth through mergers and acquisitions. And so most of our companies here in the portfolio will have multiple drivers of growth and they'll operate in industries that are growing and that um, have favorable industry structure where they can gain uh, market share over time. And profitability wise, what we really want to see in companies is a few main attributes. One is that we want to see that companies have high profitability through the cycle. And quite often, this is a attribute that will indicate a sustainable competitive advantage for a company. So um, sometimes you can go through periods when all companies will do well, for example, during a period of uh, economic strength. Many companies in an industry might do well, but you really see how top performers can gain an edge when you go into a soft patch for the economy. And we really look at the track records of our companies to see that they can be uh, cash generative and industry leading through not just favorable times in an economic cycle, but unfavorable times. We want to see our companies get out the other end stronger than when they came in. And we're seeing that right now with a lot of companies in the portfolio. Um, another element of this is that we stress test our companies to see if we go into a soft patch for the economy, will they get pinched, as it were, in the sense of having a cash crunch uh, at the bottom of a cycle, which could cause a name to be 
uh, sold at exactly the wrong time. And so we want to avoid that. So the third element is risk profile. And we're really looking at large cap businesses in this portfolio, ones that have multiple lines of business and quite often in multiple geographies. And that provides inherent cushion when some parts of the business are doing uh, not as well, other parts of the business will be doing well and vice versa. Of course, it's uh, great when they're all doing well at the same time. Um, but we also look at having non-overlapping uh, regulatory or legal uh, or tax risks in portfolios. Sometimes uh, there may be an issue outstanding with an individual company, but we want to see that these aren't issues that could cascade over the other names in the portfolio. So very mindful of risk from both a single stock and a diversification perspective. And then, of course, financial risk is paramount important to us. Um, and back to that stress testing point, you know, through this year, it's been a, a year when uh, we've really seen a lot of our companies shine in terms of having uh, good balance sheets that have allowed them to position for recovery ahead of their peers coming uh, into uh, the rebound phase post the big turndown that we had uh, in the spring. Um, last but not least, stewardship is a key importance to us. We want to see proven management teams with deep bench strength and a long-term orientation to how they approach managing their companies. Um, quite often, the management teams will have a stake in the company themselves. And uh, we're obviously looking for good top-down governance and board practices with linkages between the key performance indicators that we think drive value in the business to management compensation so that there's good alignment and you don't get these self-serving management teams that can maybe grow in a new area um, that's not in a shareholder friendly direction. We avoid that. And really uh, what we call foundations for sustainable growth incorporates uh, ESG or environmental, social and governance response uh, related criteria into our investment process. And again, this is focusing on the long term and having the right drivers in place to drive the right behaviors and to create a sustainable business over the long term. And quite a few of our companies will allocate capital and spending to new opportunities that might not pay off for a long time, but really generate sustainability. And without doing these types of investments might be, you know, short-term thinking in nature. So a very balanced perspective from a stewardship perspective. So we think from a total shareholder return perspective, if we can find companies that have long-term growth with good profitability through the cycle that generates surplus cash flow for reinvestment, and that can be reinvested by a very skillful management team, then we can have uh, long-term compounding value. Um, and, and last but not least, there's a note at the bottom of this slide talking about valuation. And we think that the main attribute in the portfolio of having quality represented very strongly will give us outperformance with below market risk. Um, but we're very mindful as well of when valuations get extended that we should be pairing back those types of positions because that introduces uh, the risk of overvaluation or valuation contraction. So holistically, we think this provides a, um, a good representation of what we're going for. Now, as far as how we go about doing that, I'll pass it off to Joel on the next slide to talk through uh, our investment process. Perfect, thanks, Sam. Um, so this slide here just talks about how we uh, go about diligencing names uh, that make their way into the portfolio. Um, so the first thing you can see on this graphic uh, on the left here is idea generation. Um, so we find ideas from many different areas, uh, conversations within the team of three that are on this call. Uh, we also have a broader Canadian equity team that manages different strategies and have different mandates. And we have frequent meetings with those teams, which often leads to uh, sharing of ideas. Um, given the TSX is a relatively limited universe, um, a lot of names that we have either previously owned in the portfolio uh, or names that we're familiar with and have passed on due to certain uh, reasons will make their way onto our watch list. And so we're able to pull names uh, from this watch list as well. And that came in very handy earlier this year uh, with the COVID-related market sell-off. And we're going to walk through an example uh, in a little bit just to highlight um, how we're able to take advantage of a name on the watch list. Um, so once we've identified a, an idea, we move into what we call our 48, uh, the 48 standing for 48 hours. Um, what this is is a, a two-day short uh, immersive dive into the company. We ultimately make a go or no-go decision on the name at the end of this um, research step. What we do is we'll assess growth drivers and we'll really focus on uh, risks 
at this point. Um, and ultimately, if the name does proceed, it goes towards the deep dive. Uh, if we decide to pass on the name, then it's put on our watch list. Um, and the reason we could pass on it here could be due to valuation, uh, due to quality, due to growth not quite being there, but we do like to make sure that names uh, go onto the watch list after this step. Uh, the deep dive is obviously extremely um, immersive. Uh, it's resource intensive. And so the 48 is a critical step because it allows us to retain efficiency within our pod. Um, the deep dive phase will really focus on understanding the industry, understanding the company, uh, doing a deep dive on ESG to make sure that we understand the risks there both to a company and to the industry. Um, and we'll often meet with the management team as well and do a, a detailed financial valuation model here to understand uh, the, the valuation of the company. The next slide dives a little bit further into how we look at ESG. Um, it's something that's very important to our research process. Um, Garz is a signatory of the, the UNPRI. Um, and what our ESG research framework does is, it, it, or what it consists of, sorry, is two different uh, internally developed tools. The first one you can see, uh, the, the back graphic here, uh, is what we call our ESG one pager. And this essentially uh, compiles scores that we use to identify red flags. Um, it do doesn't preclude anything from moving forward in the research process. It just gives us an idea of uh, areas that we need to keep a close eye on. Um, and this is something that we'll use in our 48. Uh, the next step is uh, the deeper dive, and that is what takes place um, in our deep dive report. Uh, here we use a, a TSX optimized SASB framework. SASB is an accounting standards board. And that um, we spend time going through and identifying what um, material issues were relevant to the TSX. And that allows us to then dig into those uh, areas to better understand ESG risk uh, for our universe. Uh, and of course, we are active owners um, and we will often engage management teams uh, and boards and we'll also vote proxies um, and spend quite a significant amount of time during proxy voting season to ensure that um, companies are aligned with uh, our clients. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to uh, Sam to go through some uh, market overview slides. Thanks, Joel. I'll go through these relatively quickly. They're pictures that we're all fairly, fairly familiar with by now. Um, the first page here really just shows for the G7 economies um, what the growth pattern has been. And obviously, we had reasonable growth going into the pandemic period, which then subsequently and rapidly fell off a cliff starting in the first quarter, um, but really climaxing in the second quarter. Now, we've had a big move up, and we got the Canadian numbers out this morning that were very, very strong GDP growth in the third quarter. That was expected because uh, we had a lot of activity come back that had uh, been absent. And uh, the, oh, there's a question, um, is the y-axis on the growth in percentages? Yes, it is. So we had a 30% contraction followed by a 30% or thereabout expansion. Now, obviously, the compounding math means that you end up being quite a bit less than where you left off, even though there's a big rebound. So suffice it to say that we expect continued growth uh, going forward because there's a lot of ground to make up. And on the next slide, uh, page 12, we can see um, what some people are calling a K-shaped uh, recovery. And if you think about the shape of the letter K, um, obviously one side of the letter is pointing upward and another side is pointing downwards. And really what we've seen so far is a recovery led by uh, goods demand as opposed to services demand. And we're all aware that nobody's traveling. Hospitality is relatively shut down. Restaurants are not fully active. And so the services side has really suffered, and a lot of our entrepreneurs are suffering uh, due to this dynamic of having low mobility. But the goods side, including manufactured goods like technology, uh, devices, and cars, um, and home-related expenses have really skyrocketed. People spending more time at home and uh, working from home, uh, augmenting their homes to get more space. Um, so we've seen things like lumber supply be really uh, in demand and prices moving up and things like that. Um, moving on to the next page, because of this rebound um, not being quite back to where we came from, um, and this chart is showing employment still being way off of where we came from, which 
really points to the need for further stimulus by governments, both in terms of spending by government and uh, lower interest rates from central banks, is really uh, what would support economies globally to uh, have employment recover and economic growth recover. So this sluggish uh, economic recovery means that interest rates might stay lower for longer. And on the next page, we can see that the one of the sectors that's very sensitive to interest rate levels, um, particularly the home sector, um, has been one of the surprise winners. Obviously, like everything else, you know, home sales dropped off a cliff at the start of the pandemic, but because of the impact of low interest rates and the demand for housing as people work from home and more space has really increased, we've seen activity levels really zoom up. And so this is one sector, for example, where low interest rates have a very powerful effect uh, through low financing costs. And um, we can all relate to what we're seeing in our uh, local markets there and where interest rates are for, say, a mortgage this year versus last year. Another beneficiary on the next page of low interest rates would be commodities. So, for example, gold has been very strong and also other commodities like copper uh, that's benefited from some of this increased activity in goods uh, that we showed on an earlier chart versus services. Um, a lot of this has gone into the production of, let's call it, stuff being very strong. So commodities have done quite well. And the next page really just shows, you know, what this actually means, bringing it all together for uh, the portfolio. And when you think about low interest rates, and this isn't the, the single overlying theme um, in the portfolio by any stretch, but it does uh, provide a lens through which um, some observations about economies and markets can translate through to holdings in the portfolio. Low interest rates have a different effect for some sectors in the economy than others. And so, for example, if you are a saver, obviously it's, there's less income for a saver at low interest rates than higher interest rates. Similarly, if you're a lender, um, say a bank, um, then you're going to earn less money when you are putting out loans than if you are putting them out at higher interest rates. And one of the interesting quotes over the past couple of months that we heard from a bank CEO in Canada was this quote from uh, Victor Dodig, who's the CIBC CEO, and he said um, that low interest rates to a bank is like low oil prices to an energy company, i.e. it's a headwind for um, profitability. Now, that said, our banks are well capitalized and doing very well. Um, we saw a couple of our banks report this morning, and uh, generally because the economy is doing better than expected, we're seeing uh, good performance uh, through the piece. Now, opportunity-wise, if you're a borrower as opposed to a lender or a saver, you can actually grow faster and uh, achieve a higher valuation, potentially. So examples of companies and industries that can grow faster would be companies that make acquisitions. So <clears throat> I put the name of uh, a few companies here that are regular acquirers, uh, Kushtard, uh, the convenience store operator, Boyd Group. Uh, which is a collision management uh, operator, and then CGI, which is a technology services company, when they make their next series of acquisitions, they'll be done at perhaps half of the borrowing cost of the ones they did before that. And so the cost of growth could be lower for them, and that's a tailwind for these companies. And manufacturers like Magna, that has uh, a very large exposure to automobile sales, the leading car parts manufacturer, um, cars will be cheaper to buy because interest rates are low as well. So these sorts of companies are really beneficiaries of lower interest rates. Um, and then there's a section on the bottom as well that just recognizes that in a low interest rate environment, having uh, opportunities to achieve higher returns, for example, Brookfield Asset Management in the portfolio um, is a asset manager that has an alternative asset management offering that can offer higher uh, returns and what savers are otherwise able to generate and uh, their asset center management growth has been very strong and that's in the portfolio and then companies like Shopify that have been able to grow very very quickly um, because of low interest rates those future earnings are being discounted back at a lower rate um, which has a tailwind for the valuation of the company so with all this in mind um, we have good representation with the best for example, life insurance and, and bank companies that we can find in Canada, uh, slightly 
underweight position in the portfolio. And then we're emphasizing more these companies where we see a great tailwind from having low interest rates in the portfolio. And that's really just an example of the type of ways that some of these observations and, and thinking will trickle their way into the portfolio. But I'll pass it off to Joel for a um, discussion of some of the specific examples in the portfolio, which are, uh, makes the discussion more tangible and exciting. Thank you. So what we wanted to do here is just quickly walk you through um, an example of a name that's uh, worked its way through our research process. Um, as I highlighted earlier, it is a name that was on our watch list, uh, Magna. Sam uh, alluded to it earlier. It's a large global uh, automobile parts supplier that has operations uh, across the world. Um, so we had exited Magna in the fall of 2019 as we were concerned on the, uh, the growth outlook in Asia and Europe. And we started to see uh, automotive production volume come off then. That's a name that had performed well. And so we exited the name um, in the portfolio. Um, we still like Magna uh, from an overall business standpoint. It's actually uh, very interesting because it has a lot of exposure to electrification and autonomous technology. Um, two things that you may not expect when you first see uh, Magna's production mix, given they make at the moment a lot of internal combustion engines. Um, and that's just because the majority of the world's uh, automobiles at the moment are still internal combustion. So Magna does have uh, opportunity for a higher amount of revenue on hybrid and electric vehicles uh, than it does on traditional internal combustion engines. So that's a positive going forward. Um, and the rest of the business, uh, if you look outside of the, the drivetrain business, um, is completely agnostic to electrification because you're still going to need seats in cars, you're still going to see need mirrors, um, latches, et cetera. The other side of things, autonomous technology, so things like self-driving vehicles, uh, Magma has exposure there. So um, I'm sure you're all aware of Lyft, a uh, competitor of Uber's. Uh, Magma has a partnership with Lyft to uh, share intellectual property on level five, five uh, self-driving. So that's um, completely autonomous um, driving vehicles that don't necessarily require a steering wheel. And that's very long term, but that just shows you some of the exposure that this position gives to you in the portfolio. Um, sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier, but Magna is actually a name that we reinitiated uh, earlier this year in the COVID related sell off. When I get to the next slide, that will uh, highlight how we've um, managed this position. Um, so very quickly, Magna has a, a, what's called a contract manufacturing business that isn't widely appreciated by the market. Um, if you think about uh, how vehicles are made, if you're ramping up a manufacturing plant, it's extremely expensive to do so. Uh, so it's very capital heavy. Um, and if you need uh, a manufacturing plant for a small vehicle, uh, not small in size, but small from a volume standpoint, so very niche, Magna will step in there and be able to produce that vehicle when it wouldn't necessarily make sense for an automaker to produce it on their own. Also, if there's overflow capacity, Magna can offer up its uh, contract manufacturing for that. And they've done that with things like the BMW 5 Series, where BMW already has two plants and didn't want to invest in a third, so they sent the remaining volume to Magna. And um, so the last thing, Magna has a very attractive valuation. Uh, we look at all our companies uh, from a normalized business standpoint. Um, we did stress test Magna to make sure that it would survive uh, a prolonged economic downturn uh, if the COVID-related shutdown lasted longer than we initially anticipated. Um, and through this, their free cash flow was strong, and it would take a very draconian um, scenario to cause them to uh, run to cash issues. So on the next slide, this just highlights how we've managed the position. Um, so you can see uh, in the fall of 2019, we exited the name. Um, we initiated it again um, in late March of 2020 as the market sold off, and we added to it um, a little bit further on in the uh, summer-ish of this year. Uh, and more recently, we've been trimming the name. So it's risen significantly, as you can see from this chart. We've been recycling that capital in recent weeks uh, into more attractively valued uh, names that have pent up demand and haven't necessarily seen the, the same market appreciation. The next slide I'll run through very quickly. Um, it just highlights some other um, positions and talks about market dynamics there and how we've managed those. Um, so Gildan is a name that um, was really held back earlier this year as they uh, manufacture printware. Um, and a lot of that business comes from uh, corporate sponsors. So if you're doing a, a volunteer day with your uh, corporation, 
you may be purchasing shirts. Uh, that business obviously came to a complete stop, um, a very abrupt stop. And so the, the name subsequently sold off as well. Um, we were, we did quite a bit of stress testing there. Um, they have a strong balance sheet. And so we added to the name mid this year and subsequently the name has performed quite well. Bausch Health is a healthcare name, uh, is one that we had added to the watch list very early this year and also sold off, has a lot of uh, consumer business. So things like contact lenses, um, and there was a lot of concern that wearing contact lenses would increase the risk that you um, contract COVID as you're touching your eyes. Um, and so that business was quite weak uh, earlier this year. We were waiting for some risks to clear up and that happened and we subsequently initiated a position and added to it on weakness. Uh, so it didn't perform straight away. It has started to perform more recently, uh, but it's a name that we quite like. Um, and we believe that as the company delevers uh, that will get converted into equity value. Uh, the last name is Kushtard. Uh, it wasn't one that we have added to um, necessarily this year, but we wanted to highlight it as it is a strong compounder and it's performed very well for, for this strategy. And so Kushtard is a leading fuel station and convenience store operator, uh, extremely efficient at operations. Interestingly, it does have some uh, electric vehicle charging stations in some of its European operations. And so going forward, that's another angle of uh, growth for them as they're able to leverage that experience and modernize um, a lot of their stations uh, in North America and their more recent expansion in Asia. Um, so I'll pass it to Tech to just to end on the, uh, the next slide, which discusses the portfolio overall. Thank you. The, uh, yeah, you have the portfolio here on slide 20. And what I really want to emphasize here before I open things up for questions is this portfolio, as we've tried to demonstrate uh, in the slides previously uh, that uh, Sam and Joel walked us through, uh, is, is predicated on uh, high quality uh, holdings in the portfolio, uh, high quality names. If a, if, a, if a stock doesn't meet our quality requirements, it will not be held. Uh, this is something that goes back to, for those of you who recall, you know, 20 years ago, the tech bubble and what happened with Nortel. Uh, more recently, in, in more recent years, we had an issue with uh, BioVail that we never owned in our portfolios uh, at Guardian because it never, notwithstanding the, uh, the weighting in, the, in an index, the GSX in this case, uh, it didn't meet our, our holdings requirements, our quality requirements, and we would not own the stock. Uh, so quality of the, at the security level is very important, uh, but a different form of quality is in the form of the portfolio construction, what the individual security weights are, uh, and also uh, what the sector weights are. As you are aware, uh, one of the important aspects of this investment strategy is to reduce the impact of resources uh, in the portfolio and to, and to reduce that that exposure and it has worked very well for the portfolio for a very long time now for for many uh the resources i mean that, that well it's going to be both energy and materials uh energy is primarily oil and gas it's a small part of the portfolio as you can see and on the material side the Resources would be, really break down to the precious metals, which would be the gold stocks, uh, whether it be Agnico, uh, Eagle, Barrick, uh, and wheat, precious metals, Franklin, Nevada. And then uh, we have some forestry exposure there, and then also some industrial consumer labeling business through CCL Industries. Uh, again, uh, the structure there is to have names that are well diversified, but one of the other important aspects that we've been working on uh, for a long time especially during this period of heightened volatility, is to reduce correlations of underlying names in the portfolio. As we've gone through the pandemic, we've had a lot of uh, uncertainty, uh, and you've seen the markets uh, collapse earlier on this year, and then uh, rally quite sharply uh, on the uh, anticipation of uh, uh, vaccine development and uh, rollout. So uh, what we've been trying to do is, as we have always been high grading the quality of the names in the portfolio, calling those names that uh, have, have deteriorating quality in our view, and at the same time taking advantage of opportunities in the marketplace, uh, we want to make sure we're, that we're exposed to economic sensitivity when we come out of this pandemic. And we've done that as well, but also doing so so that we have reduced correlations to reduce that volatility in the overall portfolio. 
Now I expect there's gonna be a lot of questions here, you know, as it pertains to, you know, Shopify is typically a question that we get uh, asked from clients, uh, what our thoughts are on gold, the longer term view on energy, but also the banks, interest sensitive, et cetera. And uh, so I think at this point, I will um, open up for uh, questions. Okay, uh, wonderful. Thank you very much, Ted. I've already got a couple of here to start with, so I'll just start it off and send it across to the team to see what their answers are. Um, I guess the, the obvious question is that there's uh, some moving parts on, on the economic front and the, that's going to impact the market. And a very simple question, what's your market outlook for 2021 considering all, all the things that are going on? Um, Ted or team, uh, what are your thoughts? Sorry, I, I, uh, would you repeat that? Uh, you, you want the outlook on the, on the overall market today? Yes. Um, uh, I, I really wish we had a crystal ball. Um, the, uh, uh, but we don't have that crystal ball and hopefully you're not disappointed uh, with that answer. Uh, what I would say is our, our approach before I, I do answer that question is to construct portfolios with holdings and a portfolio structure that should perform well through most macro environments. We are bottom-up investors and uh, we're not trying to make a top-down call. Now, having said that, we have to have some top-down perspective in order to invest in, in names that are they're exposed to oil and gas or uh, the price of gold bullion. We, should, we, we have to have a view uh, on, on those commodities. Likewise, uh, we need to have a view on interest rates in order to uh, uh, have a view on uh, the stocks, you know, the banks or insurance companies or utilities, any interest-sensitive company. Uh, so with that backdrop there, uh, what I would say is uh, we, we were anticipating that there would be a recovery uh, in the, uh, sorry, I'm going to take it back a little bit further. We had the narrow leadership in the marketplace uh, earlier on this year, uh, primarily in the tech stocks, the state, safe haven stocks that also benefited investments in gold equities. Uh, precious metals, and uh, we recognize at some point there would be there could likely be a shift in leadership away from those safe haven stocks and towards stocks that are more economically sensitive. Uh, many, uh, a lot of these would, would fall into the category today of of your traditional value stocks. And so we were early in our positioning there to make sure we had that exposure. And, and I repeat my comments before on having exposure names that are not correlated with each other while we had that economic sensitivity. We have been constructive on coming out of this pandemic uh, with pent up demand. Uh, the market may be ahead of itself right now, and we are concerned about that. Uh, the uh, so we, we we are very mindful of that, but again, we uh, the portfolio is positioned well for sustained uh, uh, global economic growth. But these are not we're, we're not chasing shiny objects uh, in the marketplace here right now uh, with a portfolio. So the outlook is cautious, but with optimism. Uh, valuations uh, are a concern overall. However, in a period of lower for longer interest rates, uh, we do believe uh, the valuations can be sustained. And obviously one of the big hurdles to get across was US election. And we had the strong rally in the marketplace following the US election uh, south of the border. Uh, does that answer the question? I think that does it very succinctly. And I'm gonna, just gonna add a follow-up question. This was actually for, uh, by, by one of the people on the call. And uh, the, the initial question was, you, you noted earlier that you mentioned some, some uh, surprise winners in 2020 this year. Um, and the, the question was more about uh, what was your, what do you think the surprise is going to be for 2021? And I'm gonna add on to that question. I, I, you know, I do, you know, you're supposed to have a crystal ball, Ted, you know, uh, put it to good use. Uh, and the other question is, maybe if I'll just rephrase the question. What looking forward? What keeps you up at night? <laughs> okay, uh, the, the, the first one on the crystal ball. Um, the surprises for uh, 2021. Uh, I I I, I think uh, uh, the surprise may be uh, the market right now is discounting a lot of optimism 
uh, tied to vaccine development and rollout. I think there could be some disappointment there. Uh, I think there could also be some disappointment possibly on the extent of the macro global growth. And I only uh, throw that caution there because uh, a large part of the economy is really having a tough time in the service industries. Uh, the lower paying jobs, travel, airlines, uh, food service, et cetera. And uh, so I, I think, you know, the impact of that to maybe, maybe more difficult to manage. Something is very different in this environment today uh, as we're coming out of the pandemic uh, versus, I mean, the last example we had was, um, if one wants to take it, uh, would be, the uh, uh, the 1916 uh, Spanish flu, and the uh, uh, and that was a very di di different economic environment. And uh, I, I was I would just throw some caution there. Uh, we already have high debt levels here uh, in the system. The government's been doing uh, a lot to support. Uh, governments have been doing a lot to support the economy, um, and so I think the market's just kind of a lot of good news, especially in the context of the U.S. election. Uh, it's sort of, we sort of got a, what I would call almost a ideal outcome as far as uh, changing the leadership out of the uh, from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. Um, uh, but there, and, and we still have some uh, some balance there, so that uh, the Democrats cannot go too far uh, in their uh, taxation policies, et cetera, that uh, might have an adverse uh, uh, impact on the U.S. economy. So that that's a, that's the first question. There surprises would be on the uh, uh, the optimism may be a little bit ahead of itself right now on what happens uh, with the global economy next year. Uh, the next thing I would say. Um, uh, so, sorry, repeat, repeat the uh, uh, second question there. What keeps you up at night? Uh, no, yeah. Um, <laughs> what I would say there is everything keeps me up at night because um, uh, I, I, I am a warrior on the portfolio. But I think what, what I'll, I'll shift it to is what helps me sleep at night. And what helps me sleep at night is the underlying quality of the holdings in the portfolio. So if there is a, an event out there that can catch us off guard and, there, and, there, and there, there likely is that event out there, we're quite comfortable in the holdings of the portfolio. Uh, but the risks out there that keep me awake, uh, it, it is the, has been the narrow leadership uh, in the portfolio. It's been the strong reaction uh, from a lot of the value stocks here right now. That's how quickly things can change. And, you know, I worry about what can happen with uh, OPEC plus on the price of oil. It's not a big impact for this portfolio, the strategy, but I worry about that. Uh, I worry about gold. Gold has always been a, a form of ballast in our portfolios. And again, it's under it's underrepresented uh, in this strategy. But I, I, I do worry about that. And I and I worry about uh, if, if the extent of what can happen with a second wave of the virus prior to getting uh, the vaccines rolled out effectively. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, that, 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 that puts a lot of the questions to rest. Now, just to change the question a little bit, I mean, as you well, well may know, uh, not just in the market, but also for the municipal, uh, uh, municipal investor base, uh, ESGs are concern, ESG is a concern. Uh, that is has always been uh, in the in the, the limelight, and I think it's becoming more so, especially on the on the green front in uh, in in recent years. Um, and one of the questions I, I, I uh, received was trying to um, interplay that with the quality approach. And the question, uh, quite literally, was: Are there stocks that might have met your quality characteristics? but were excluded from the portfolio because it didn't meet your ESG criteria. So it's a, it's a matter of how you interplay these two, uh, two concerns together. Uh, I'm going to start by saying the, uh, uh, the implementation of ESG factors into our process is something that dovetails really well naturally uh, because it plays into our emphasis on quality historically. Um, 
So I, I there on, on the ESG front, uh, I can't think off the top of my head of names that would have been rejected because again, it, it, it is an integrated part of the process uh, for our, our when we're looking at our quality investing. And Sam walked through all of that uh, when he described the uh, quality wheel. But I think I think what I will do is I'm going to open it up to uh, Joel uh, or Sam if they have anything further they want to uh, uh, add to that question. Yeah, I, I will very quickly just highlight that we've spent a lot of time um, on ESG integration in the portfolio, and it definitely has not led to exclusion of names. Um, if anything, it's furthered our understanding of um, risks in industries. Um, and so, like Ted mentioned, quality goes hand in hand with great performance from a uh, governance and environmental and a social standpoint. Um, what we've also noticed, which is extremely positive in our opinion, is the uh, names in this portfolio, the management teams are extremely willing to engage us uh, on ESG related issues. Um, and they're some of the leaders in their industries when it comes to disclosures. Uh, so obviously that's kind of the, it's the, the elephant in the room is disclosure around ESG metrics. And it's very challenging because there's no standard when it comes to uh, disclosures of certain metrics. And a lot of the companies uh, in this portfolio are really leading the charge when it comes to uh, putting the, their best foot forward with disclosure of certain things. Um, so I'll leave it there. It's obviously still something that is developing on a weekly basis and we continue to enhance what we do on the ESG side of things. Um, but we have had some very interesting conversations with research providers uh, and portfolio holdings to ensure that uh, ESG research providers are really understanding uh, risks and how management teams are addressing ESG. So it's been a very interesting uh, 18 months to two years on the ESG side of things. So thank you very much, Joel. Hey, uh, just to, to, I mean, we're running a little bit low on claw on time, so I'll have one, one last question, and it's gonna be on the same question, uh, same uh, front. When, uh, when your team presented to, to our investors, I guess last spring, that was prior to uh, a major announcement you made on the ESG front with the UNPRI. Uh, and I would just like to kind of explore that just a little bit more to, uh, to give you an opportunity to discuss what that means or what are the, whatever proactive roles that Guardian is taking on the ESG front that would be aligned with, with what uh, the initial investors would, uh, would be looking for. I'm gonna bring Joel onto this Definitely. again. I can Perfect. I can get started and then Ted, Sam, Brian can feel free to, to jump in. Um, so we, Guardian Capital, signed UNPRI um, in June of, of this year. Um, wasn't something that the company overall took uh, lightheartedly. So we spent uh, about a year and a half really making sure we were prepared to uh, sign that. And because it isn't something that you can just sign and figure out after the fact, we wanted to make sure we were ahead of uh, everything that needed to be done. Um, and so in terms of changes, there haven't really been any changes as a result of, of signing onto the UNPRI. That all came ahead of that. So it's something that as an equity team, we really ensured was integrated into our research process. Um, but it goes beyond that because we have a fixed income team, we have a real estate team, we have a quantitative strategies team. And so we really had to work together to make sure that it was something that was scalable across the organization. Um, and that posed its own challenges. Um, but I think one of the, the really positive takeaways from this is that as a, an equity team, we're able to, to leverage the strengths within uh, all of our different teams to really scale up the ESG research uh, coverage because within a different mandate or strategy, everyone looks at different names in, through different lenses. But when it comes to ESG, we have a common framework that we use. And so we're able to, to cover more companies uh, more quickly on the ESG side of things. I'll pause there if anyone wants to jump in and add anything. Perhaps I will. It's Brian here. Um, just to add, Guardian has been involved in responsible investing since around 2007. We, we launched a, a family of, of uh, 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 responsive, socially responsible investment portfolios. Those portfolios have particular screens attached to them. So you can imagine uh, weaponry, tobacco, nuclear, and so forth that they screen out of those portfolios. Now, uh, it, and that, that uh, 
course of history with Guardian really follows the, the course of history with the whole ESG space uh, in the marketplace as overall. So with the United Nations responsible the principles of responsible investing, uh, there's not a prescribed um, uh, criteria that securities have to be uh, eliminated from the portfolio. So for example, there's no, there's no requirement that any particular industry or like, like tobacco or nuclear be excluded from, from the portfolio. So really what this is, is a movement from a way of the values type of system where things like tobacco are eliminated to more sort of a, a responsibility, a mainstreaming, if you will, of ESG research. The idea is that you go from the values based to sort of the integration into day-to-day -day research activities. So the onus then uh, it becomes, falls on the portfolio manager to say, well, uh, there's not a particular value set, but I need to understand what the ESG issues are with all the companies that I hold. And can I satisfy myself that this company is indeed responsible in its actions? So that is the difference. So we've been involved in this space, even though, as Joel said, we were ramping up to mainstream this ESG research. We've been involved in this process for, for more than a decade uh, overall. Uh, so we're just now taking from a, a smaller group of, of strategies to, as I say, day-to-day -day mainstreaming of that approach. Well, that's great. Okay, I, th I think we're, we're pretty much out of uh, time here. So uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for uh, giving me the lowdown on the, on the, on the portfolio, um, for polishing up that, that crystal ball and giving us a bit of an outlook <laughs> for, for what to expect <laughs> in the coming year. And I want to thank everyone uh, that they called in to, to, to listen in uh, and, and learn more about the mandate. Uh, again, I'll just remind you, that, uh, remind the, uh, the folks call, calling in that we do have another call on Thursday morning at the, the time, same time slot with MFS to talk about our fixed income mandates. Uh, so uh, be aware of that and I hope you'll be able to join us. So again, thank you to all for, for joining us for this webinar. Thanks all. Thanks, have a Thanks, good day. Everybody. Bye now. Thank you.